song of intimacy. To see you hide beneath of shining in the light of your glow. Pour out your power and love as we sing. songwriter says Ebao, Ebao. that is to say we reverence you we adore you we worship you we exalt you we enthrone you 
We glorify your name, Jesus. You're the reason we live and move and have our being. Our source, our sustainer, our strength, our fortress, our refuge. You are our uncle, our redemption and sanctification. You are our righteousness, our wisdom and power. You are exceeding great reward, Lord. We bless you. Thank you for what we began to do this weekend. We have gathered again this morning to sit at your very feet, looking into your eyes and hear you speak a word that changes lives and destinies, a word that brings us closer and closer to you. A word that will prepare us, people, fit for the masters at his coming. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Glorify your name, wonderful Holy Spirit. We trust you again to bring your oracles to bear in our lives again. Grant us understanding of your heart as you speak. Let the wax in our ears be cleared. Let the veils be lifted. Let the skills from our eyes fall off. So that in hearing that we hear and understand and then we shall be converted. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Glory be to your name. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Good morning all. God bless you. We are here again. <coughs> um, I don't think I'm going to Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Please, we don't need much uh, introduction. Just Yeah. 
this morning, I bow my knees before your majesty. You are God. Heavens, you are God on the earth. You are God beneath the earth. You reign in majesty. And this morning, I surrender. I submit to you, spirit of the living God. I pray that you will put your words in my mouth. As I declare your counsel this morning, make me a faithful messenger, a faithful vessel to proclaim your counsel, the full counsel of God. And I pray that you give to this congregation and to the congregation online a listening ear, a, a heart that understands the mind of God. I take authority over every plan of the enemy, every foul spirit, every unclean presence in this place. We rebuke the devil. We speak the heavens open over this auditorium. Glorify your name, Lord, in the midst of us, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, put your holy hands together and give God a clap of praise. Amen. Amen. Good morning to you all. We are glad to be here again this morning. We want to thank you, thank our host for the great hospitality. We are glad to be in Lagos. Thank you. And thank you for giving me a driver, military. I think my driver should be a military officer. I drive. Masters is scar. Thank you. Doing a good job. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, we want to continue from where we stopped last night. How many of you were here last night? Praise the Lord. We want to welcome those of you who are joining us and even the online church. All of you from all over the world joining. The Lord bless you richly. So I, I told you, maybe tonight I'm going to preach a little bit. But this, this morning I just want to be the messenger. I want to just recount faithfully. Whatever. Hello? Amen. So yesterday I began to tell you, we, we ended yesterday when the Lord said, the reason I brought you here was to tell you three things, remember? Number one, I brought you here so that you see that the mansions are finished. Now I want to tell you, heaven is not a concept. Heaven is not an idea. Heaven is a place, a real place. And as true as you are hearing me and seeing me, Heaven is a place. Now see, if you've never been to New York, you can stay here in Lagos and claim as much as you want. That New York doesn't exist. It doesn't cancel the fact that New York exists. And some of us have been there. No? Now, you may not claim that New York doesn't exist because you see that on TV. But if you didn't see, have a TV, you can stay here and say, what is New York? And some, some preachers will tell you heaven doesn't exist. Oh yeah. I've heard it time and again. A million times and more. Some, some, some say before God made the heavens and earth, where was he? <laughs> that heaven is not the, the focus is not heaven. We are not going to heaven. It, God's idea is to bring his kingdom here. No? That's what you hear. It's this kingdom, where we're going to deal about. Let me let me finish telling you the story, and then maybe we'll talk we'll handle some of this. Now, I want you to believe, to know, to believe, as real as you can see me and hear me. Heaven is real. I've been there four times, and I can't wait to go the fifth time, and I can't wait to be there forever. So he said the first reason I brought you here was to show you that the mansion that Jesus came to prepare for the saints are finished. And I saw them. It's not a, I'm not telling you a dream. I saw the place. The second reason he said I brought you here to, to announce to you that the second coming of Jesus to rapture the church is more than imminent. But the church on the earth is not ready. Now, if you don't believe that Jesus is coming soon, that we are at the end, we are not just, we are not drawing here. We are almost, we are there. We are living the last days. And COVID-19 had given us a, a proof that these are the last days. See, what we, live, what we experienced in 2020 
The world had never experienced such a thing. I mean, from World War I to World War II, the world had never come to a standstill for months. Standstill. Everything shut down. Nobody going out. No, I mean, like everything, all the airports closed. The whole world, it tells you this world is going to soon end. And you know, somebody said that man is the only animal that doesn't remember history. You know, COVID-19 came and I thought after COVID-19, people will fear God. You know, during COVID-19, nobody, well, what were you doing with money? Nobody needed money for nothing. The only thing we wanted to be, just to be alive and breathe. <laughs> no, nobody needed his car. Nobody need, we needed food, medicine if you were sick and just the breath of life. Wake up in the morning, go to bed in the night, stay home. And you know, at that time, suddenly all the preachers began to preach. The return of the Lord, sanctification. Hey guys, we need to fear God. As soon as COVID-19 passed, they went back to selling oil and selling water. Went back to our gimmicks. I mean, hey, Jesus is coming. And a lot of people don't know it. And he says he's going to come as like a thief in the night. No. Many will wake up one morning and the church, the real church will be gone. The makers will still be here. They will be the one going to, they will go to television and explain that, oh yeah, these people have disappeared. Actually, the Bible said. I hope you will not be one of them explaining to the television, to the radios that the ones that are gone are actually the real believers. So he said, I brought you here to let you know that the second coming of Jesus is more than imminent, but the church on the earth is not ready. I said, yes. Then he said, the third thing he said, if the trumpet of the rapture was to sound today, only a tiny minority, a very slim minority, listen to me, a very slim minority of the people who call themselves Christians will be raptured. And I said, no, Lord, why only a tiny minority? Meanwhile, when we look around our nations, we see mega churches springing out. Thousands and thousands of people going to church. As, as a matter of fact, when you look at the massive churches that we have, you have the impression there's some revival going on in our nations, right? Oh, especially in Nigeria. I mean, like, you're, you're talking about the nation that has most of, if you are talking about mega, if there are 10 great pastors in the world, the first six are in Nigeria, right? The whole of Nigeria goes to church. It's full of church. It's packed. If you want to see massive church, come to Nigeria. So I told Jesus, but I told him, why, why just a tiny minority when we see all these multitudes going to church and we have the impression something, some kind of revival is taking place on the earth. He said, Nyangok, do not be deceived by this multitude you see coming to my house because they are not looking for me. It's not me they want. They come in my house for the things I give. And I say, yes, but when they come for the things, you give it to them anyway. He said, yes, I give it to them because I am a generous God. He said to me, in my nature as a generous God, I give freely. I give lavishly to all men, not only to Christians. Listen to me, brothers. God is not only good to Christians. He is good to all men. And the proof is that every day he causes the sun to rise for the righteous and the unrighteous. When the rain falls in Lagos, it doesn't only fall on the roof of the church or on the farms of the believers. It falls for everyone. True? God is good to all men. As a matter of fact, the richest men in Lagos may not be Christians. So. See, this is a country where we have the richest man in Africa, right? And this is a country where we have the biggest churches. I mean, the biggest church auditoriums in the world are here. The biggest world pastors are here. But the richest man in this continent that comes from this country is a Muslim. Yeah, but it doesn't ring a bell, you know. He says, I give it to them because I'm a generous God. In my nature as a generous God, I give without looking at faces, without looking at religion. Then he said something, Mama, that I will never forget. 
He said, in my nature as a jealous God. That day, he showed me a scripture that I had never seen all my life. I mean, all my reading of the Bible. Or maybe I read it and I, never, I didn't pay attention. But that day, that scripture came to me like Exodus 34 verse 14. Can we read that? Exodus 34 and verse 14. Do not worship any other God. Or for you shall worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. The Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. See, if there's one thing I will never forget of my first visit to heaven, is the jealousy of God. See, before I went to heaven, I thought my wife was jealous. Oh, when I came back, I told her, your jealousy is so small, or oh, small. You see, when somebody is jealous, when a woman is jealous of her husband or vice versa, he doesn't want anyone to come, no? Those of you that are married, when, when you walk with your wife and she sees that something else has taken your attention, even if you, had, you didn't follow the thing or just, you just got distracted a little, you know, it changes the atmosphere in the car, you know? True? Oh, uh, are there husbands here? Uh, you know, you see, for the next two hours, there will be, you have to struggle to, to bring back serenity, right? That's how we describe jealousy. He says, the Lord, your, you shall worship no other God for the Lord your God, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. He bears, one of his God's names is jealous. He's not just jealous, he bears it as a name. So he said to me, in my nature as a jealous God, I do not tolerate cohabitation. I do not share. See, the moment there is a situation of sharing between God and any other thing in your life, his jealousy warrants that he should step out. He, he doesn't live in an environment where he has to share anything with anybody. So even in your life, if there is a, a competition between God and anything, you know what he does? Silently tiptoes out of the scene. And he leaves you with the impression that he's still there. But it's a long time he left you and you don't even know it. He said, in my nature as a generous God, I give to all men. And God doesn't give us things because he approves of our lives. So no. Paul said eh, that the goodness of God, the aim of the goodness of God is to lead us to repentance. It's not that we see his goodness and then we come to him. So he's, he's being good to us to draw us to him. He's not being good to us to approve of the way we live or what we do. So I asked him, so Lord, but why only a tiny minority? He said to me, because the church on the earth is full of idolatry. And he went, he went forward and said, even in your church? I said, no, in our church, in Alpha Naomi, there is no, he said, yes, there is idolatry in your church. Now see, our church is a church, like a simple church like this. No protocol in my church, all this wahala of, you know, great man of God, carry Bible, do all of this. We don't do it. We are just a simple loving, a simple people loving God. We want to please God. We try, you know, to be as down to earth as possible. There is idolatry in your church. I said, Lord, if there is idolatry in our church, it means you and I don't have the same definition of what idolatry is. Lord, can you tell me what idolatry is? In fact, he's talking to me and I'm in tears. I'm crying. I can't hold myself. I'm crying. I'm, I'm sobbing. Lord, what do you call idolatry? He said the idolatry that is in the church today is not just the conventional idolatry of people worshipping stones, mountains, and what we, we conventionally call strange gods. 
You know, like the Buddhists, the Hindus, and whatever not. Those things that we call strange religions. <coughs> he said the idolatry in the church today is not just that conventional idolatry of people that are not coming to church or that are worshipping some divinities that we don't know about. He said the idolatry that is in the church today is in the hearts of my people. And that idolatry is being nurtured and entertained by you, the pastors. See, God was not lenient with us, the pastors, at all. He said, I am angry at you, the pastors, and I want you to go everywhere in the world and tell pastors I am not happy with them. See, everywhere we go in the world, we, I make sure I have a session with pastors because I want to tell them what Jesus said. In fact, the first people he sent me to are the pastors. Because the church is in this condition because of the kind of pastors we have. He says, you are the ones that are responsible for the idolatry that is in the church today. I said, Lord, what have we done? I mean, he was talking to me. To me and to my colleagues, the pastors. He said, what have we done? To, to cultivate and nurture idolatry in the church. He says, you are responsible for the idolatry that is in the church because you have forsaken the preaching of the true message of the gospel. You are the one that have taken my people to entertaining entertainment and to, you know, this motivational speaking and all this nice, God will bless you. I said, Lord, what do you call the gospel? That day, he had to explain to me what the gospel is. I said, Lord, so what do you call the real message of the gospel? He said, the real message of the gospel is Christ and him crucified and nothing else. See, whatever you preach and teach to the body of Christ, if it is not Christ and him crucified, if it doesn't point to Christ and him crucified, it's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. Paul said to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when I came to you to announce to, to, to announce to you the testimony of Christ, I didn't seek to know anything else except Christ and him crucified. Christ and him crucified. Any message that is not centered in Christ and him crucified, that is not geared at pointing to Christ and him crucified, is not the gospel. He said, you the pastors, you are the one that removed the eyes of the people from, the Christ, from Christ and him crucified. You took their minds and their hearts to the supermarkets and to the shops. See, all of our gospel now is pointing people to the embassies where they got the visas, pointing them to the supermarket where they buy the new cars. You know, we are not pointing Christ to them. In fact, as he was talking to me, see, a man of God that I know very well, appeared on the screen said, you know this man? Look at this one. It's been more than 30 minutes he's preaching. And he's not telling the people about me. And he was preaching real good, I promise you. I mean, good in the sense of what the church likes today. He was prophesying all kinds of breakthroughs and blessings. He says he's been talking now for more than 30 minutes. And he's not showing them me. You know that we can have a full service. People falling under the anointing. Even getting healed. And we didn't present to them Christ. If you say amen like thunder. Your prosperity will be greater. Amen. They will run to the altar and connect. See I prophesy. In the next 21 days. If I um, be a man of God. You will do this and you will do that. And they say Amen. All we are showing them is what they will get. We are not showing them the one that will give it to them. And very few churches point people to Christ. Show Christ to the church. They come to us, not they don't want to know Christ. They want to get healed. They want to be delivered. They want to prosper. They want to go to America. If you can give them visa, they will give you money. Like I said yesterday, it's become a den of thieves and a, ro a, a den of robbers. The pastor has some anointing that can produce what you want. Then you have the money that he is looking for. So he's robbing you and you are robbing him. 
a thief on the pulpit and a thief on the pews. Church has become a market. I have a product that you all want. Right? That's why you all came this morning. Because I have an anointing. I have a product that you want. And in, in exchange, you have to sow a seed. You have to pay for it. He says the church is full of idolatry. Then I said, Lord, up to now you haven't told me exactly what idolatry is. So, Lord, what is idolatry? And he said to me, from the mouth of the Lord. I didn't know this definition until I went to heaven. He said, idolatry is anything whatsoever that competes for space and attention with God in your heart. Anything whatsoever that competes for space and attention with God in your heart is an idol. And I said, Lord, can you say that in basic English? He said to me, idolatry is anything that you love as much as you love God or more than you love God. If there's anything in your life at all to which you are attached or you are attached to it or you, are, you, 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 you pledge an allegiance to it as much as you pledge to God or more than you pledge to God. That thing is an idol. When he explained that, I mean, I cried even the more because I realized from where I was. Now remember, I'm under this, I'm in the, in the tunnel, lying on my face. I mean, I could see the church and I knew we are almost all lost. Because all these people come to church because they want to marry. They are not blessed until they get a breakthrough. Now, today I'm asking the church, so what is even this breakthrough thing? What do we even call breakthrough, pastor? What is it? Because what we, the church, call breakthrough? Some pagans out there, so, I mean like they, seriously? So you, you mean you gather like this, you've been here since 5 a.m. to get this thing that they get without God, without, without effort? No? See, you need God to come down from heaven and help you get something that unbelievers, your neighbors that are not saved, they get it without God. Some of them don't go to Babalao, they're just ordinary unbelievers. And they live a simple, ordinary life. They are not doing magic, they are not doing forward. No. And they, they, they get, they naturally get those things that you need God to kill his son on the cross for. Some serious-minded people, when they think about this thing that we do, they have no business with us, as, and they are not wrong because of the kind of message that we have presented. You know, one day my sister, one of my sisters, called me from Douala, crying on the phone. I thought that they, somebody had died. I mean, like she was in tears. I said, "What is it?" She said, "My boss has just insulted me." I said, "What have you done to him?" She said, "We, are, our church, was preparing." We are preparing for our church convention and they gave us invitations to invite our, our colleagues and, and I took a VIP invitation to my boss. My sister is a director in the company and she took it to her check the general, to the general manager and, and then the man, very polite man, he took the envelope, opened the, the invitation and he read through the invitation, put it back in the envelope, closed, sealed it and gave it back to her. I said, Madam, thank you for your kind invitation but I don't need the services you offer. And I ask her, so what was written on the invitation? There will be healing and deliverance and breakthroughs. I said, so the man is not sick. <laughs> he doesn't need the visa to go to America. <laughs> and he doesn't need breakthrough. He has money, he is rich. And he was, I mean, I said he was polite. He gave you back the invitation. He said, you can help somebody else. The services you offer, I'm not interested. See, the kind of gospel we preach in our churches, I mean, some, some people out there are not interested. If they are not sick, they don't see the need to come to church because church is all about you will get the miracle. You will get the... It's not like... You know, when you talk about eternity to people, eternity puts all men at the same level. The rich and the poor, the great and the small. When you, when you, if you are presenting eternity to them, we all become, 
we come all to the same level. But when you're talking about blessing, what is a blessing to you is a toy in somebody else's house. No? That guy you are making big noise about, praise the Lord, come and see what the Lord has done. That guy, some other person here in Lagos is driving his dog inside. It's a dog's car. True? So he said to me, because of idolatry, very a tiny minority because of idolatry in the church. He says, I will show you how it manifests. This evening, maybe I will do a teaching. I will bring a teaching on idolatry because I want to expand on it so you see it from the Bible perspective. Not from the story perspective. You will see it. I want to show it to you in the scriptures. And you will discover not many people will be saved. Pastor, this thing of not many people will be saved is not new. It's not today. So sometimes when you announce it, people think like you are, you are a prophet of doom. You are, you are trying to make heaven difficult. It's not, it's, it's not us trying to make heaven difficult. It's been difficult from, the, from, from day one. See, Jesus said, if you discover that your right eye is going to be a problem to you, do what? He didn't say go to the doctor, let him put anesthesia and then help you. No, he said you yourself, pluck it out and throw it in the fire. It's better for you to enter heaven one eye than to have two and go to hell. Is it written like that in your Bible? From the, from, from the mouth of Jesus himself. He said if your right hand will be a stumbling block, cut it off. That's a kind of determination and violence you need to make it into heaven. You know today we are settled in a kind of gospel that says no. You just need to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. That's it. The moment you have done that, every other thing you do after that doesn't matter. Oh, Mama, how I wish it was that easy. Even me, I would have loved that kind of gospel where you just say yes to Jesus and then you go, you back, to night, you go back to nightclub and then you dance and sleep and drink alcohol and do all that everybody's doing. You know, marry 14 wives. Now he said, look at, look at how idolatry manifests in the church. When we come, we gather in the house of God. And they say it's offering time. We drop in the offering basket the change that the taxi driver gave us. We drop any, just anything. Most of the time, you know, I, I'm very, I always very curious. I, when we, it's offering time, when I'm giving my offering out, I always look into the offering basket. And you will discover we give to God what doesn't matter to us. You know, when we sing and when we worship, we all tell Jesus how, you know, he is the ogre of ogres in our lives, right? He is everything to us. We cannot breathe without him. But you see, when it's time to give offering to God, that's the time you have to prove that worship that you just said. But you know, your hand knows the five, five naira. Is it five? Does it a five naira be? You know, you know five naira, you know two. When you put your hand in the pocket, you, your fingers know the difference between the notes. And by some, by some reflex, you know, naturally, we only go to the small notes. That's what we put in the basket. But you know, in the same service, if one, one of those prophets begin to call your names and tell you your card number and your telephone number, then the real money will come out. True? When it is offering to love God, we give chicken change. But when it is offering for our breakthrough, then we sign the big check. I'm not, are you seeing the picture? When it is about God, we give chicken change. But when it's about us, like I just saw you at the embassy and you are being given a visa to go to Canada. Suddenly, I don't even have to ask you for money. You just go to your pocket and remove one, one thousand or one million naira and bam, come and seal the prophecy. But when he said, well, if we just tell people, let's give to God. Let's worship the Lord with our offering. If you don't have to, if you know, we make no sermon after that, just say, let's come and see. You know, when, Mama, when I came back from heaven, first I decided we are no more taking offering in our church. 
It is my wife and the leaders that said, no, daddy, you can't do that to us. I said, no. You know why? When I went to heaven, he told me that, please, tell my people don't want to insult me with what they put on the altar. So I came and said, please, I will not give you an opportunity to insult God in this house. He doesn't need your money. I don't need your money either. So keep your money for yourselves. You know, when they pleaded and we started taking offering, when we do offering, I will take the offering and pour it on, the, uh, put it in the altar. I said, hey, look. Look at what you have given to God. And this is not for me, it's not, I'm not trying to take more money from you. I'm just doing this so I can point you, I can show you your heart. So that you, don't, you stop lying to yourself and lying to God. In fact, you're not lying to God because he knows you're not saying the truth. So when it's our offering time, we will drop just anything to God. He doesn't see, no, he's not here to see. But what you don't know is that every time we put the offering basket here, Jesus stands there and he's watching. Can I tell you something about offering? He said to me, 80 to 90% of what we drop in our offering basket doesn't get to him. doesn't get to him. He doesn't receive it because he cannot receive it. It's not worthy. See, the last time you saw Jesus in the New Testament, in the synagogue, it was offering time. When the people were dropping offering, he was watching, right? After the offering, he made an announcement. Did he make an announcement? What was the announcement? He said, of all the people that were giving an offering here today, it's only this widow that has given an offering that made sense to heaven, that, that reached heaven. The only offering that God received today is the offering of this widow. It's not because her husband is dead. It's not because what she gave were two mites. No. Some rich people came and threw some big notes of Nairas. But you see, it's not what you give to God, or it's what you keep. Paul said, if your offering doesn't correspond to your level of prosperity, it's not acceptable to God. That you can find it in 1 Corinthians 16. So everyone on the day of the Lord should put aside an offering. Everyone according to his prosperity. Hmm? So imagine on the day of the day the, the president of Nigeria is celebrating his birthday. And then we all decide to give him a gift. If the minister of finance of Nigeria, I don't know who he is, buys a necktie or a bow tie of 10,000 naira as a gift to the president, what do you think the president will do? <laughs> Now, if me, an anonymous pastor that, is in, that lives in Nigeria, sends a, a tie of 10,000 naira to the president, he will receive it as a gift. Oh, Apostle Nyango, who is Apostle Nyango? Say, oh, he's the one Cameroonian pastor lives in Lagos who sent this. Okay. But the Minister of Finance cannot give to the president a tie. The president will either think it's a prophetic act or it's an insult. No? So when you are bringing your offering to God, if it doesn't reflect who you are, like God is seriously you, this is what you are, you want to give me a gift and this is what you are offering to me. But you see, we, we come to God to, to take. When it's time to love him or to prove to him, see, God doesn't, what does he do with our money? He doesn't need it. He says, if I was hungry, it's not to you, I will say it. Because thousands on the, uh, the cattle on the thousand hills belong to me. No? But you see, the, the, the privilege we have of bringing our seed, our offering to God, is an opportunity to express our heart. Like, we really love you. And the, one of the ways we, we can prove it is by giving for your work or giving for your house. Or by my giving, 
I proved my love. Because God proved his love to us by giving us his son. No? See, idolatry. Number, number two ways it manifests. Every morning in Lagos, you have traffic. Right? Morning and evening, yesterday we were coming, the traffic was crazy. This morning I was surprised it was shorter. We, you know, we just drove and we arrived. Because it's public holiday today. Is it public holiday today? But on, on the days that are no public holidays, mornings and evenings, heavy traffic. Everybody is pressing to go to work, to go to school. But you see, when you have to go to work and you want to go, you have to go to school. You do everything you, you can to be on time. No? People who just, I mean, I saw some cars that should have been out of the way. Like, they are old, and, but you see, they are packed with people who are struggling, they want to go to work. They don't mind the state of the car, provided they get to work or to school on time. But you see, there's those same people that every day they wake up early and they go to bed late. When it's time to go to church, they come late and nobody has the right to tell them, why do you come late to church? The only person that must understand is God. When we are traveling, those of us traveling by plane, when they say you have to be at the airport three hours before your departure time. And we respect it. When you have to go to an embassy for visa, you, they make you sit all day waiting for your turn to go to the window and answer three or two or three questions. No? You have patience for that. But you, cannot have, you don't have patience if you have to wait for your pastor. We don't have patience when we have to wait for God. We have time for every other thing except for him. See, our churches are the shortest. I mean, the shortest, the shorter the service, the better. No? Because if you drag too long, the people begin to frown. In fact, if you are not, if they are not, if you are not lucky, they will even walk out of you. Because, my friend, we have better things to do. So, you know, the year before I was taken to heaven, one of our friends had an encounter. That was December 2014. Early January of that year, I, I think it was 2nd or 3rd January, we called him. It was a Sunday morning. I called him to greet him and wish him happy new, happy new Year and all of that. Then he began to recount his testimony. He's been in a retreat. The, the year 2014, he was locked up for nine months. Is it six months or nine months? Six, nine months. On a retreat, locked up in a house praying. Didn't go out. See, if you want to walk with the living God, number one principle you must observe is to learn to give God time. You must do what? You must learn to give God time. Why? Because God does not have time for those who don't have time for him. See, when you are in a hurry, you can't do... Have you ever gone to a friend and you wanted to really have time with him to tell him, express some, explain something very important and you saw that he was in a hurry and then you said, okay, we'll talk another time. No? God too. When you come into his presence and he looks at your face and he sees that you only have 30 minutes. If he wants to talk with you for one hour or two, he will postpone it to another time. You are not ready. You, are, you don't have time now. So one of the principles you must observe, a very important principle, if you want to go places with God, you want to travel with God, you must learn to give God time. See, this friend of ours was in a retreat and now towards the end of his retreat, one evening he was praying and then he was, he was taken in a vision. In his vision, he saw the, the end of the world and he said, God had, all the inhabitants of the earth was on this side 
And the kingdom of heaven was on the other side and separated with a deep and long gulf. There was a big gulf that was separating the two. And on this gulf, a little tiny bridge. And now the Lord, and under the bridge was a lake of fire. And the Lord will make a raw call. They will call you, when you hear your name, you come on the bridge. You stand on the bridge and then the Lord will begin to recount the story of your life. And as he's recounting it, the, something is moving you towards the kingdom. And if Jesus finished telling the story before you cross over, the bridge will open and then you will fall in the lake of fire. And then he says in that vision, the first 1,000 people that were called before him, only two succeeded to pass. The rest of them fell in the fire. And he was 1,001. When his turn came, he was confident as a man of God. He came and stood on the bridge and the Lord said, your name is so and so. He would answer yes. And you are a man of God. You have done this. You have done crusades. You planted churches, traveled across the world. And he was moving and he was moving and he was moving. And he says he was two steps away from entering when the Lord said, unfortunately. Suddenly the music changed. Unfortunately, all these things you were doing, you were doing them for you and not for me. And he says the bridge opened and he fell in the fire. That's when he came out of the vision. And when he came out, the Lord began to tell him, I appeared to you in this vision to tell you that your life has been weighed. I've checked your life and your ministry. And I found you zero over 20. And the Lord said, I'm giving you, I appeared to you in this vision to give you a second opportunity to go back, not only to amend your own life, amend your ministry, amend your teaching. So he's telling, he's telling us this story and he's crying. And he says, my brother Pierre, we need to prepare the, the, the church for the coming of the Lord. The Lord Jesus is coming. And I tell you, less than 2% of believers on the earth will be saved. Now, we are listening to him. We all are seized by the fear. I mean, the, the fear of the Lord has gripped us. And we are listening. My phone is on loudspeaker. And we are, the, just the two of us in my room. The children have already gone to church. He finished talking and then we prayed. When we left... When we finished, we went to church. My wife and I sitting in the car, nobody talking to each other. We're just pondering over what this brother just said. We went to church, finished. On our way back, I asked her, so what do you think about what this brother said in the morning? She said, ah, my husband, my, I'm, since then, fear has gripped my heart. Oh. Then I told her, I was the one that made the first comment. I said, you know what? I believe that he really had a genuine encounter. But I don't agree of, with the... With the percentage that he gave. He said less than 2%. If he had even said 20%, I would agree. Or 10%. I think less than 2%, 2 is an exaggeration. He said, the, the, the percentage is too small. So, we kept it within ourselves. You know, when I went to heaven, brother, and Jesus told me, he didn't give me percentage. He told me a tiny minority. That's what made me cry because I remember what this brother said. And I began to ask him, so why only a tiny minority. See, Jesus didn't give me a percentage. But from what, from what he was saying to me, I knew 2% was even too much. And today I can show it to you with the Bible. The Bible you hold, I will prove to you that 2% is plenty. He was generous. The figure has, does, is not even up to 1%, Pastor. You want me to prove? See, Moses brought out about 3 million people from Egypt. The statistics says there were about 3 million men that came out of Egypt on their way to the promised land. After the 3 million that left Egypt, how many of them got to destination? So, can you take a calculator and just do your maths and tell me? Two out of three million. Two. The rest of them died in the desert, including the pastor that brought them out of Egypt. Number two proof. 
In the New Testament, Jesus was asked, Matthew 25, 25, right? What will be the sign of your second coming? This second coming we are announcing. They asked him, so what will be the sign of your second coming? He says, there shall be no other sign than the sign. In the, my second coming will be like in the days of Noah. Ah, in the days of Noah, people were dancing and eating and marrying and giving to marriage. Until Noah and his family entered the ark. Now the question is, how many people were saved in the days of Noah? How many? Eight people. Now, how many inhabitants were there on the earth in the days of Noah? We do not know. Were there billions of people? We, now, just imagine that in the days of Noah, it was only Lagos. That the earth on the, in the days of Noah was just the city of Lagos. No other. Forget about America and Cameroon and the rest. Just Lagos. If in Lagos, now, God only saves eight. How many, how many millions are we in Lagos now? Twenty? So imagine out of the 20 million that we are in Lagos, eight people are saved. This good God saved eight and drowned the rest. See, the Bible says for more than a hundred years. See, a great pastor is not a pastor that has a mighty followership. Forget about this multitude that we, it's good. I mean like, for the ego of the pastor, it's good that you are counting numbers and you are seeing millions of people sitting in the auditorium. But the real question is, how many of them are in tune with God? Great Noah, preacher of righteousness, preached for a hundred years and more. Eight people said eight. That is an encouragement to me. Eight, brother, eight people. And it is not Noah that closed the ark. The ark was closed from outside. You know that. So Jesus said that will be the sign of his second coming. It will be like the days of Noah. Now, if you are 20 million people like we are in Lagos, and out of these 20 million, only eight are saved. Can you do the math for me? It's 0 0.00000. We are not even, we are not even anywhere close to 1%. I gave you the figures yesterday. Jesus fed a multitude. There were 5,000. Okay, Matthew 24. Thank you. 5,000 men. They saw bread and fish and they were happy and they wanted to make Jesus their king. Jesus said, before you make me your king, let me explain to you what are the, what, what are the conditions. If you, I will be your king, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Jesus was preaching that sermon and the people were walking out of the church. He was seeing them walk out of the church until they all left. He didn't stop preaching until the last person left. And when the last person left, he turned to the twelve. He said, oh, oh God, you two can go. And Peter said, to whom else shall we go? You are the one that has the words of eternal life. So of, of this great multitude that you have, only 11 people had seen the way to eternal life. The rest of them were just coming for the festival of bread and fish. Free, free miracles, free breakthrough, free whatever not. Now, doesn't it ring a bell in your mind that a country like Nigeria, we have the biggest churches of the world in Nigeria, but corruption, Nigeria like Cameroon, like everywhere. I'm not it's not like an indictment on Nigeria, but it's because I'm in Nigeria. Look at the number of churches we have. Look at the believers. Look at, I mean, look at the church everywhere. The multitude that go to church, it doesn't show on the civil life. Corruption, unrighteousness, violence, whatever not. No? These same people that go to church, what gospel do they hear every Sunday? That when you meet them on Monday in the streets, they behave the way they behave. And all of them have stickers on their cars. All those good stickers that you can imagine of. That say they are church people. No? It's because what they hear is not the gospel. 
See, the kind of gospel you heard the day you got saved will determine the kind of Christian you will be. Huh? Unfortunately, most people that come to our churches have never heard the gospel, the real one. What they heard was just some kind of evangelical speech. You know the kind of evangelical speech? It's not gospel. It's one speech that sounds like church language. You know? Or one man that will come and say, me like this, you see me, I was born in Sokoto. We were very poor. My father and my mother they abandoned me. I grew up in the streets. And one day I met Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. God changed my life. Now I am a man of God. I traveled the whole world over. See, I have this number of cars. I have this amount of money in my car. Is God not good? Everybody said God is good. So how many of you want to give your life to Christ? The whole congregation will come. Because anybody that was born in Sokoto wants to be People, you know, people want to be rich. They want, they want your kind of life. They are not coming to Jesus. You didn't, if, see, if you say the things that I just said, it's not, you didn't present the gospel to somebody. Most of, I wanted to say most of you. Oh, of course, all of you that are watching online and even on site. What you heard was somebody told you, if you come to Jesus, he will change your story. Come to Jesus and he will change your life. Now, and what, they, what you meant and what they understood by he will change your life, it's not like he will take away your sinful life and give you eternal life. No. You are struggling, you are not married, you don't have a job, things are hard. Come to Jesus, you will get a better life. And people got born again, quote in quote, after they heard that. That's why we have a hard time, Mama, making disciples. That kind of gospel doesn't make disciples because, in fact, the ingredient that makes disciples is, was not in the message they had. Are you with me? See, Mama, the percentage will be 0. 0.000. And, you know, that doesn't bother God. Before you and I were born, he had decided that the path that leads to eternal life will be narrow and the gate will be small. It was not decided yesterday, it's been like this forever. So that not everybody will have access. One day, Luke chapter 13, they asked Jesus, I think from verse 22 or 29, there about, they asked Jesus, 23, Luke 13, 23, are there only few that will be saved? Yes. Then one, then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, verse 24, strive to do what? Where? Through the narrow gate. Why? Many will seek to enter and they will not be able. <laughs> if many will not be able to enter, it means how many will enter? But my, those, the new, Jesus' preaching was littered with this statement. And we never paid attention to it. All we saw is that multitudes followed him. Now I want to ask you, the day they arrested, today is Good Friday and we are commemorating the death of Jesus on the cross, right? That day when they arrested Jesus, all this multitude that he fed, those people that he healed, the blind people, but blind Bartimaeus, what was, where was blind Bartimaeus when they arrested Jesus? You would think that all these blind and all these sick people and all these that Jesus raised from the dead, they will come and say, you will kill us before you will touch him. They were not there. In fact, you will even be surprised that they were among the people that were shouting, crucify him. When the early church started, he started with 120 people in the upper room. No? It's just a few weeks that Jesus had gone. And this Jesus, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 were attending his meetings. They re all received miracles. He, and the he, Bible says, time and again, and he healed them all. Do you know that miracles don't have the power of saving people? And he healed them all. 
You don't count the blinds and the lepers. He cleansed the blind eyes that he opened the, the deaf and dumb. You don't count them. He healed them all. But they were nowhere to, they were nowhere to be found. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. See, when Jesus was talking to I was, I mean, that, that day I cried all my tears. You know why? Because I was seeing myself as, as lost as any other thing. Like, if this is the condition to enter there, then we are, who will be saved? You know, Jesus will finish preaching and then people will ask, then who will be saved? If this be the condition, then nobody will be saved. And Jesus will say to man, it is impossible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I say unto you, many will seek to enter, and they shall not be able. It means only a few. You have to get, see, the reason we are giving this testimony, he sent me to announce this in the world, so that the number will change. God's intention is that we, they, we increase the number of people that will make it. That's why you are, if you are hearing this, you are blessed. You should count yourself blessed that you are hearing this testimony. So that it gives you a chance of waking up from your sleep and say, hey, this thing is not as I thought. Hallelujah. He told me he is angry with the pastors. He says, one of the things that makes him angry with us is that when we preach, we talk more about us than we talk about him. Our congregation know us more than they know him. And they are more loyal to us than they are, than they are loyal to him. See, we were supposed to be signboards. So when we stand here, we are pointing to him. In our preaching, in our speech, in everything we do, we're supposed to be showing him to the church. But no, today, they know the man of God more than they know the God of the man. The anointing of the man of God is greater than God himself. If you see the way we venerate, and I'm not saying that we should respect the past, our pastors and our leaders, but the way we venerate our men of God, like you wonder, Jesus is looking at you and like, see, we are so, you know we are supposed to be servants of God. Servants. Not Lord, servants. So he said to me, see, with tears in his eyes, say, Nyango, can, you, can I trust you to go help me find my bride? They have hijacked my bride from me. He says, help me recover my bride from the hands of these hijackers. See, we pastors have become hijackers. We have hijacked the church of God. And Jesus is looking for his church and he can't find it. With tears in his eyes, he said, can I trust, can I count on you to help me? That's why I said, that, I mean, in Kabura, I tell all the pastors, all the pastors in the world can preach something as, I, this message I'm preaching, is, in fact, it's not even my message. I'm just announcing the message. He told me to go and announce, I am a messenger, I am announcing. Your congregation know you more than they know God. They are more loyal to you and they are loyal to him. In fact, you have never given them the opportunity to see him. And he's talking to me with tears rolling on his cheek. Nyango, can you help me? And I was, I mean like I'm crying. All my tears. So I'm here. I'm here in Lagos this week to announce to the church. Jesus is looking for his church. He's looking for his bride. Looking for his bride. You see, on the earth, when you commit a crime, they take you to court. No? The magistrate will look into, the, into your file. They say, oh, this one is a... is a... you committed a minor crime. You just stole. 
Huh? Not only the minor crime, maybe you are just a, a, a novice. You just, you have never been in prison before. You've never had a case before. You know, the, the magistrate can look at your circumstances and decide, okay, maybe because of this and that, he can decide to give you a minor punishment, right? And even if they sentence you to prison, the punishment will be proportionate to the crime you have committed. If you stole 1,000, maybe six months, three months or six months, they will not, and when they take you to jail, they will not put you in a cell with the criminals that have killed people. Different, in, I don't know how about in Nigeria, but everywhere in the world, prisons have different quarters, no? They, 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 how do you say? No. Uh, I'm looking for the right word. Those who are not yet, at these young, young adults, Juvenile, thank you. The juvenile have their quarter, you know. You, 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 if you did something and you are, you are not yet an adult, they put you in your quarter. The women have their quarter. And then the, the novice in robbery and all of that. And then the armed robbers and all the great criminals. Different quarters in the same prison. You know, in hell, there are no quarters. And the sentence is the same for everyone. Small offense, big offense, same price. For the wages of sin is death. Big sin, small sin, same punishment. And hell only has a gate in. There's no gate out. Now, I know today some pastors have said we shouldn't preach hell because it's not good news. The good news must make people happy. But le listen to me. If you are not sick of HIV AIDS or cancer, if today on radio they announce, or if they announce on TV today that they have found a medicine for cancer, it will not be good news to you because it will, just, it will be news but not good news. True? Because you are not concerned cancer, what does it concern you? But someone who is sick of cancer, or if you have a relative or a, a, a parent that is sick of cancer and they announce that they have found a medicine that can cure cancer, that would be good news. In fact, in some homes, people will throw a big party. That finally we have found that medicine. You see, the news about the death of Jesus on the cross it's good news because we were all sentenced to death. We were, we were, we were on our way to perdition. And then someone came with a news and said, you don't have to go to hell anymore. Somebody else that loved you enough had died for you and paid the price. That's what makes the gospel good news. Because we were all lost. So if there was no condemnation, the death of Jesus on the cross had no value. Why must he die on the cross if there, if there was no? Hallelujah. Now see, in the book of Revelation, Jesus gave us the permission in the last chapter of Revelation so that when you read your Bible and you are now concluding, Revelation 22, he gave permission, express permission. He says, I think from verse 10, <coughs> No, no. The last 10 verses. I, I can't remember exactly. Look, at for, look for me. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Yes. Blessed are they that do these commandments. Yes, go, go on. We dogs are dogs and all of that. Yes. He said, let him that is righteous continue to be righteous. Which verse is that? Verse 11. 22, 11. Thank you. He that is just, let him be, now let he, he that is unjust, 
let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. See, and this, the last page of your Bible, he put this scripture there. So that when you are finished reading now, he gives you the choice. He says, if you want to be filthy, don't just do small sins. Sin where? Huh? If you want to be unjust, I mean, do it well. See, being a Christian is the only thing you cannot do halfway. Is either you are fully Christian or you are not at all. So if you want to be saved or you want to be righteous, be righteous all the way. If you want to be holy, be holy all the way. Because, see, you will be shocked. Matthew 25, the parables of the, the virgins. You know the parable of the virgins? They were all virgins, mama. Virgins means uh, they never went to nightclub, they never did fornication, they never ventured into adultery, they didn't do... That's, that's what it means to be virgin, right? They were virgins. Number two, they were all waiting for the groom. Number three, they were all dressed up and ready. Number four, they all went to wait for the groom and waited until late in the night. And the Bible says at midnight, there was a loud cry outside. Behold the groom, go and meet with him. That's when the difference was made between the wise and the foolish virgins. Last minute, there were virgins, they were in church. And now imagine virgins thrown outside in the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Can you imagine a virgin in hell? Somebody said, what a waste, right? Yeah, so, it's either you want to be saved, and you are properly saved, and you are ready for eternity, or you are not. Or it, 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 it doesn't pay to be in between. You were a church girl, you know, trying to, you were singing the choir and doing all this and doing other things too. See, when I finished talking with Jesus, he was talking to me and I was crying. And he said to me, I want to show you something. See, one of the experiences I had, still in that tunnel where I was lying, he's talking to me. His words were coming to me in sound and images. He's talking to me about very few people that will be saved. And then this man of God, another man of God, not the first one that I saw, another one appeared. He said, do you know this man? I said, yes, I know him. I said, he's the man of God. He said, look at him keenly. Papa, I'm looking at him, and suddenly the, this man becomes transparent in my eyes. And the Lord said, look at his heart. His heart was full with all kinds of covetousness and greed. All kinds of ambition and, you know, pursuits. And Jesus was standing behind him. And the Lord said, you see this man? It's a long time since him and I are separated. And he doesn't even know it. He's still doing ministry. He's preaching, traveling around the world, planting churches. He's making waves. But he's separated with me. And I'm standing behind him and I've been knocking at the door, trying to come in and he's not even hearing me. And the Lord says, if the rapture took place today, this man will not be raptured. And he said, there are multitudes like him in the church. You know, while he was talking to me, he said, come, let me show you something. He brought me to the earth. Took me around the globe. From Africa to America to Asia to Europe to everywhere. From church to church. See, in some churches we came and stood at the window. We were seeing them, they were not seeing us. Big churches. And 
I remember this particular church somewhere in Africa, and I will not tell you which nation. And that nation is not far from here. <laughs> Standing at the window, we're looking through the church. Great man of God performing mighty miracles. I'm standing there and I'm, my I'm crying. Like, not that tears are rolling down my... I'm crying. I'm asking Jesus, how is this possible? That miracles are taking place in a church like this and you are not present. He said to me, Nyango, it is written in your Bible that in the last days, many will say to me, we prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. We walk miracles in your name. But I will tell them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. For I have never, I have never known you. Never. So the question is, which, in which Jesus were they performing in which Jesus' name were they performing the miracles? We are standing on the window. This particular church I'm, I'm talking about. Massive crowd. I mean like from the poopy, you can hardly see the end of the crowd. And while the man of God was ministering, some people walked in with someone that had an accident and amputated of his two legs. They brought him and dropped him on the altar. And under the eye of the camera, the, the man of God knelt down and held the two legs that were amputated. Commanded the legs of this man to grow. And the legs grew in the eye. I'm standing at the window with Jesus. We are looking. And this guy stood up and started running on the altar. People were falling and fainting under anointing. And I'm crying. Even the more. And I said, Jesus, you need to explain to me what this means. He said, I brought you so you will see churches that are without Christ. They drove multitudes, I mean, thousands and thousands of people go there. But Jesus is not there. And they don't even know it. You know the church of Laodicea? The seventh church in the, in the book of Revelation? Jesus was outside though. And the people inside did not even know he was outside. They were having church. They were having their whatever not. The Lord wasn't present. They didn't know. He was outside, knocking at the door, trying to come in. They were not hearing him. They said, we are rich. We have enriched ourselves and we have need for nothing. And Jesus will answer them from outside. Say, you, poor, miserable, wretched, and blind. You know, that is a prosperity church. We are blessed. We are prospered. We don't need nothing. Not even God. They put him outside and they don't even know. So I'm crying and I'm asking Jesus, can you explain to me? He said, I will explain. Then he said, let me show you this. You remember when the children of Israel came out of Egypt? They crossed the Red Sea. When they got on the other side, idolatry entered the camp of Israel. They began to murmur and grumble every day because they remembered the cucumbers and the onions of Egypt. And they wanted to swim and go back to Egypt for the cucumbers. And the Do you know someday, one day, I traveled to Egypt with my wife. We went to Egypt and from Egypt we went to Israel. We went to Egypt just to go and taste the cucumbers and the onions. I want... I wanted, I wanted to see what was in the cucumbers and the onions of Egypt that would make some people want to swim. Papa, can you imagine seeing the miracle of the Red Sea open? You cross the Red Sea and God drowned Pharaoh and his army. Just seeing that miracle, is it not enough to make someone? No. The next day, oh, they have forgotten the miracle. They have forgotten that God opened the Red Sea. They wanted to swim to go back to Egypt because they wanted to eat the cucumbers and the onion. So we got to Egypt. We got to Egypt in the night and the morning. I told the hotel attendant, please, we want to eat real onions and cucumbers. <coughs> and he went and got for us onions and cucumbers. I told my wife, please, let's taste this. And so maybe there was something in this. And there's nothing in those onions. I mean, like it's onion like onion anywhere. 
But these people were ready to swim back to Egypt for onions and concombers. They, they, every day they would curse God and curse Moses. They troubled Moses so much that God, see, God swore in his anger. Are you with me? That this man will not enter his rest. What I didn't know until I went to heaven, the day God swore in his anger that this man will not enter his rest. God withdrew from the camp of Israel. For 40 years, he, God withdrew from the midst of them. He did not remove the pillar of fire and did not remove the pillar of cloud. The pillar of fire was still with them during the day. I mean, the pillar of cloud during the day and the pillar of fire in the night, but God wasn't there. I didn't know that until I went to heaven. He said to me, the day I swore in my anger that they will not enter, I pull out of the, I pull out from the midst of them. But I didn't remove the emblems of my presence. See, pastor, we can have the emblems of God's presence in the church and not have God. Please give me Numbers chapter 14. I want us to read that Numbers 14 in as many versions as we can. Verse 29, I think 29 or thereabout. Yes. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to, the, to your whole number from 20 years old and upward which have murmured against me. Yes, go on. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein. Save Caleb and the son of Jephune and Joshua the son of Nun. Yes, go ahead. But your little ones which ye said shall be a prey, them will I bring in and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness. And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your wardoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. Verse 34. Which ye search. Now after the number of the days in which ye search the land, even 40 days each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities even for 40 years. Even 40 years and ye shall know my breach of promise. But that verse 34. Can somebody else has a different version? More, more now here they say, You shall know my breach, and you shall know what is like to have me against you. Somebody, some other version, then you will discover what it is like to have me for an enemy. Yes, and you shall know my displeasure. Yes. And you will know what it means to have me against you. Now, some other version, the version I'm looking for says, you will know what it means to be deprived of my presence. Hmm? Somebody has a version that says that. And you will know what it means to be deprived of my presence. You have... Amen. You will know what it means to be deprived of my presence. See, that day when he swore in his anger, he pulled out. But he didn't remove the pillar of fire. He did not remove the pillar of cloud. So they were walking under the pillar. They had the impression, the illusion that God was there. But God wasn't there until they all died. When they all died, God came to Joshua and said, now you can circumcise that children will continue the journey. So you can have the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud in your ministry and not have God. I hope you know that God even promised, proposed to Moses a promised land without him. 
Huh? He says, I will send my angel. He will do for you whatever you want. You want prosperity, you want breakthrough. I will send an angel. He will give you breakthrough. He will give you the prosperity you want. He will cast out all the enemies and give you the pro promised land. But I'm not coming with you. I'm not coming. See, the second thing he showed me, he said, I, in first, I think first Kings chapter 18, Elijah, Elijah is on the mountain. God brings the fire. But God was not in the fire. God brought the wind. God was not in the wind. And God brought the earthquake. And God was not in the earthquake. After these three signs passed, then God came in a still small voice and spoke to Elijah. And the Lord said to me, Nyango, you can have an earthquake ministry on the earth without God. You can have a wild wind ministry on the earth without God. You can have a fire and brimstone ministry on the earth without God. If all you want is just to make wave, you want to make news, you want... See, that guy of the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11, he had a mega, super mega ministry. Right? Even Jesus didn't break the record of that guy. Because that pastor of that Tower of Babel church was the only pastor that made unanimity in the whole world. Even Jesus did it. Not, the, the world was not unanimous about Jesus. If Jesus was his contemporary, I'm not even sure he would have been a, a, a deacon in that guy's church. Mighty, charismatic. Build his tower until he was almost getting to heaven. You see, the, the God's silence is not, doesn't always mean that he, it doesn't always mean consent. That God hasn't said anything doesn't mean he approves. Amen. See, when he finished showing me that, he said, let's go back. He's taking me back. After we have taught the earth, he's taking me back to heaven. Then he shows me this mighty man of God. I mean, fathers among fathers of this faith that we profess. He said, you see this one? He's not my servant. You see that one? Doesn't work with me. You see that one? I didn't send him. I mean, many of them. They are still alive. Some of them have died. So many of them are still alive. I mean, like, I'm, I'm crying, mama. I want to pull my, my hair from my head. Like, if this one is not a servant of God, then we are lost. See, don't ask me for their names. I will not tell you. The only person to whom we gave me permission to call the names is my wife. When I came back, I began to call their names. I told my wife, you see this man of God like this. In fact, I, I barely could call three names and she was crying. She said, please don't call their names. I, don't. I said, I'm telling you so that you are one of the witnesses. She said, I don't want to hear their names. You see, I went to heaven on, in 2020, 2015. The first, my first rapture was July 2015. You know, shortly after I came back from that, testimonies began to come out of some great men of God. I mean, great among the great. That have had encounters with God and Jesus told them, you not, your place is not here. You know, the first day my wife heard, she said, you heard? I said, I, I told you. And there are many more. If you, in fact, don't call their names, they are, they are disciples who stone you. The idea is not even to call their names so that we put, we bring reproach or disgrace. No, that's not the idea. But see, if these mighty ones will get to the gates of heaven and Jesus will tell them, you are not, your place is not here, then we need to fear. This thing we're talking about is not a joke, it's real. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, as I, as I conclude this morning for this first session, I want you to think about your life. Are you ready? Are you ready? See, you can be a pastor all your life and go to hell. And there will be, in fact, let me even be more, let me, let me say this and say it well. There will be very few pastors in heaven. 
See, another, I think it's a Tanzanian or Kenyan pastor was raptured and went to heaven. His testimony is on the social media. You can, you can check it. And he says he was at the gate with Jesus. And people were coming in. And he was shaking. Jesus was shaking hands with people and welcoming them. Shaking hands with them and, and welcoming them. Welcome in. Welcome in. Welcome in. And after a while, Jesus saw a man that was walking alone and coming. And the Lord Jesus ran to, the, to this man and gave him a big embrace. Embraced him so warmly, congratulating him and escorted him inside. When he came back to the gate, the, this pastor asked Jesus, who is this man that you had to run to him and embrace him and welcome him this warmly? And Jesus said to him, of all the people that have been entering here, this is the first pastor that I've come. And Jesus said to him, not many of them come here. So when I see one of them, I really have to give him a special salute. You know why many pastors will not make it to heaven? Can I say that and we pray? For two reasons. Oh. Number one, Paul said, no, James said, we the teachers of the word will be judged more severely. Now, if those who are judged normally are barely saved, how much more those who will be judged more severely? That's why when today I see the rush of young people wanting to be pastors. Now I'm not saying that so that you run away from the calling if God is calling you. But it has to be God calling you. It has to be a genuine thing. It's not just you're going for ordination, you want to carry something on your head that you don't know about. Number two. Jesus said, if you do not get converted and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And you know, pastors, if you are looking for complicated people on the earth, some of them, it's is easier to meet the president of Nigeria than to see some pastors. True? Oh, if, see, if the woman with the issue of blood lived in our days and he has her deliverance, her healing, had to depend on some pastors, where will she pass to touch the hem of his garment? Because the bodyguards and the protocol would throw her a million miles away. Hallelujah. So, see, when, I, when we finished, we went back to heaven. Jesus asked me, no, Jesus is not telling me about idolatry. All these things are, you know, he, when he finished telling me about the idols, the idols of money, the idols of, all these idols that we have all in our hearts, those things that we desire, that we want to acquire by all means. When he finished telling me about idolatry, I asked him, so, you want, you, he said, Nyangok, I'm sending you back to the world. I said, I'm not going. I told him, see, I'm not going. Or I've entered here. I'm not leaving this place. He said, I didn't ask you if you want to go. I said, I am sending you back. I said, if you are sending me back for my wife and my children, they will be fine. I will be praying for them from here. He said, it's not for them. I'm sending you back because your assignment has not begun. I brought you here because I want you to go as an eyewitness. I want you to go and tell the world about this that I have shown you. And I told him, if I need to go back, then do me a favor. Please, Lord, point to me the idols that are in my heart so that I can remove all of them here and put them on. See, you know, idolatry. Some of you, if you go back to your room today, check your wardrobe. The idols are filled in your wardrobe. You buy shoes and clothes like madness. You alone, just one, one, one foot like this, you have 20, 20, 60, 100 pair of shoes just for you alone. You see, that money that you are putting on shoes, you buy, you buy, and you keep, and tomorrow you are planning to buy even newer shoes. Some of them, it's been six months or one year, you have not worn them because there are too many. But you keep buying. You, do you know it's idolatry? You burn God's money in futility. We buy the things we do not need with the money we do not have to impress the people that do not like us. 
One day I went to preach in America, and you know this this apostle that invited me. When I got home, to, I got to his home. You know, like you know their culture, they will take you around, show you their house, you know. And then he took me around his house, showed me his children's room, and then he took me to his own room. He has his dressing, a full room like this. His shoes, his own shoes alone, about 500. One person. I, I asked him, all these shoes, are you selling shoes or is just... He said, oh, I look, it looks like you and I wear the same size. You can, you can sell. I said, I'm not, I will not take your shoes. He said, why? I said, because these are idols. I said, why do you need all these many shoes? He says, no, you know, I, I, when, there's, when there are sales, I buy them and I keep for... I say, see, these are your shoes alone. If you sell them, the money from these shoes can organize a big crusade to save thousands of people. The money just from these shoes can, can build a church. But you see, we have lost touch with eternity so much that we are so earthly conscious and earthly attached. See, Jesus said, build, pile up your wealth, your treasures where? In heaven. But when you look at your lifestyle, does it look like you are piling up treasures in heaven? No, you want to drive your best car now and live in your best house now and wear your best shoes now. I mean, your best life is here and now. What happens there, we will see when we get there. No? That's why you struggle to give your offering. That's why you struggle to give to God. That's why you struggle to even serve God. Because you're trying to let me get as much as I can get now. Your, 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 you have clothes in your wardrobe that you have not worn for. In fact, some of you are hoping that you get slimmer so that some of the suits. I don't want to talk about ladies. Your handbags. But you see, that money that we waste in futility, if we were eternity conscious and we were heaven conscious, we would have invested it there, not here. No? Yes. That money could print out tracts. The money that we use to buy these shoes that we, some of it would have been used to. One day we went, I, I traveled to Douala with my wife. And then we were supposed to go and come. We went for a pastor's meeting. The, past, the meeting lasted longer than, than expected, so the evening found us. We couldn't drive back. We decided to stay the night. My sister and I just, I just mentioned that whose boss insulted her. I called her and said, hey, we are in Douala and she, we are sleeping here today. She said, are you coming home? Where we were having a meeting was not far from her house, so we drove to her house. We went there, we ate, and so she said, are you, where are you sleeping? We said, no, we're going to the hotel. So you always come to Douala, you, you always go to sleep. Why don't you sleep in my house? She insisted, so we decided to stay the night with her. She gave us her room. You know, when we finished, we went to the room. I was removing my, I was dressing in front of the mirror. You know, in front of the mirror, her, her table was there with all her jewelries. And her, you know, when I saw the things that were on, the, on, the, on that table, I, I, I made a loud cry. Ah! She was in the other room. She heard me and ran. She said, Pastor, any problem? I said, yes, come, come, come. She thought maybe something had happened to me. Or... And when she came, I said, my sister, see idols in your room. <laughs> she was trembling. She said, you made me to be afraid. I said, you better be afraid because you are on your way to hell. She said, no, daddy, you don't mean. I said, wrist watches. Her wrist watch is 16 wrist, wrist, just wrist watch is 16. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 16. I say, all this, is, it, is this just to read time? She said, oh, daddy, you, you, you are exaggerating. See, it's just, you know, when you're wearing this dress, you want to match your shoes. And, you know, ladies, right? So I said, okay, can I take your calculator? Let's, let's do a little exercise. So I said, 
This one, how much? This one, how much? And I said, add up. The adding up. By the time we finished doing the just the wristwatches were a million and more in safer. In Naira, it would be like twice. About. Just your watches alone, one million and plus. I said, you see these watches like this? Just the money you put in the watches. I'm not talking about handbags and other things. Just your watches. We could organize a mighty crusade. You could sponsor a crusade with this money and save 1,000 people. You see, you are not even thinking about it. And buying the watches looks so natural. I mean, tomorrow you go to the office and somebody will come and present another kind of watch and you, you buy it. You have lost touch of eternity. You are enjoying the blessing of the Lord. That's how you say it. Enjoy the blessing of the Lord now. We want instant gratifications. It must be here and now. You must show it. It must show on you. It must show on how, what. Your car must be the latest. And God has nothing with you driving the latest car. It's just when he does the proportion of what you spend here and how much you have there. That's what says if an, you are an idolater or a worshiper. So, after he spoke to me about idolatry, now he says he's sending me back to the earth. I said, Lord, please, before you send me, scan my heart and show me my own idols so that I can remove them all here. So that I don't run the risk of going down there and not coming back here. You know, those of us who have had the privilege of seeing that we are more at risk than you that didn't see. <laughs> you know that, right? That's why Paul said, I deal hardly with my body. I put my body under subjection. Less. I'll be cast away after I preach to others. A lot of people will preach to others and they will not make it themselves. I don't know why, what Bible you people, people read. But Paul who saw the third heaven and who wrote more than half of the New Testament live with the fear that he could be cast away. So I told him, Lord, show me my own idols. He said, Nyango, if there's still anything that impresses you, in the land of the living. That thing is an idol. I said, Lord, what does that mean in simple English? He said, if there's still something in the land of the living that you must do at all costs or have by all means, that thing is an idol. You know that day I understood why the Bible says that true Christians, when they pray, they say, if the Lord wills. Like there's nothing that I must have by all means. Even marriage. Oh, the papa, you're talking about that because you are now you are married. No. Even if I wasn't married, this is the eternal truth. If God wills, we will marry. And if he wills, we will have children. And if he wills, we will build our house. If he wills, we will travel. If God wills, we will. And if he doesn't will, we don't want what God doesn't want for us. You must, you must serve God at rest. You must walk with God in total rest. If God gives it to me, it's good for me. If he doesn't give it to me, it may be good for others, it's not good for me. And I'm quiet. But you see some of your faces, when I look at your faces, I see pressure. Like, but God must do it by all means. That's why you will bribe God with seed and offering and sacrifice. You will do all kinds of crazy actions so that God will just find a way of giving it to you. So he said to me, if there's something, anything that impresses you in the land of the living, that thing is an idol. Mama, the world has lost its value in my eyes. See, I travel with my wife the, the world over. I, you will not see me going to, for shopping. Shopping. What do I do with the shops? There's nothing to see in this world. I, come to, I can come here I'll go from the airport to the hotel, hotel to church, and to church back to airport, and I'm out. Because sometimes I, I, I go to some countries, and then they want to take me around to sightsee. I say, hey, my friend, leave me in the hotel with Jesus. I'll stay in my hotel room. See, my name is Pierre. It means stone. I am a stone. If you put me here, come back two days later, you'll find me here. I'm not going anywhere. I will sit here and not move. Because there's nothing to do. In the, there's nothing in this world. Like I said last night, 
The reason you want to live in this world as long as you can is because this is the only place you know. The day you see another place, you will know the difference between the two and you will know which one is more important. So he, that's why he said to me about the idols in my heart. Then he asked me the last question. Nyangok, what is this crazy desire in your heart in, and in the heart of your colleagues, the pastors, for wanting your ministries to grow by all means? Do you want your ministry to grow for you or you want it to grow for me? See, that question he asked me, it's like my mind was open like this and volumes were downloaded into me. You know, suddenly it dawned on me that we can, you can work tirelessly for your ministry to grow, but you're not working for God. The real idea behind, the real motive behind you wanting the growth of the ministry or the growth of the church is not for God, it's for you. Because the bigger the ministry, the bigger the man of God, right? No? The bigger the church, the bigger the offering basket. Of course, the bigger the church, the more popular the man of God can be. So we can be working for, the, for those, not for, this, for him. See, that delivered me from the pressure of wanting to have. No. See, the tr truth be told, me, even us, we wanted to have a big ministry. We wanted the church to grow. When, we, when I came back from that experience, I told my wife, this ministry will grow at the pace of God. If he wants this to be 10,000 someday or 50,000 someday, let him do it. And if he wants it to be just a few hundred, see, we are satisfied with what God wants. Oh, who, and we are not going to, see, we're not going to dilute the message. We're not going to make it softer. We're, going, we're not going to make it seeker friendly, like the Americans will say, so that people will feel comfortable and they come in. What is the point of having a church of 32,000 men when 30,000 of them are fornicators? No? See, when I read the Bible now, I, I mean, from Old Testament to New Testament, you will see that this thing is not meant to be a crowd-pulling thing. <clears throat> Gideon blew the trumpet in Israel. 32,000 people rallied behind him. Right? And then the next day, God told Gideon, hey, don't mind, don't mind this multitude you are seeing. They are not all with you. See, tomorrow morning when you go make the announcement, all of you that are fearful and cowards, I give you permission to go home. How many people left him? 22,000 people left him. You are a pastor of a mega church, 32,000 man church, and 22,000 of them are cowards and fearful men. No? He was left with 10,000 people and God said, oh, even these 10,000, there are still too many. Take them to the river and I will show you who are the real ones that are for you. How many were left? 300 from 32,000. Now, if you have a church of 32,000 men and 300 are saved, Please, can you do the math for me and tell me what the calculation is? Hallelujah. So I want us to pray. Shall we rise? See, after hearing this message this morning, you don't need an altar call. Or you don't need a prayer point. Because the message itself has given enough prayer point. So I want to, I will invite the pastor to come over, but I want you to start praying. You must give an answer. After hearing this, if your heart has been touched, if the Lord has spoken to you, whatever he said to you, turn it into a prayer point. Go ahead and talk to God, please. Concerning what you have heard, in any area God is opening your eyes or touching you or pinching you, just go ahead, pray. Pray. The idols in our hearts, 
is not a conventional idols. If there is anything on planet Earth in the land of the living that gets your attention more than anything, it's an idol. It could be your husband, it could be your wife, it could be your children. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I must not be counted out. Go ahead and pray. In the name of Jesus Christ. That is still reflecting. Whatever doesn't show you, that is magnifying yourself in me. Take it away. Take it away. Take it away. Whatever it is that is inside me, that doesn't look like you. Take it away. Take it away. Whatever it is that will hinder me from seeing your face, oh, take it away, take it away, whatever doesn't look like you, that is still reflecting in me. Whatever doesn't show your grace, that is magnifying yourself in me. Whatever doesn't look like you, that is still reflecting in me. Whatever doesn't show your grace, that is magnifying yourself in me. If there be that hinders me from you take it away take it away if there be anything that hinders my worship take it away take it away hinders me from you take it away take it away if there be anything that hinders my worship take it away 
take it away those things that are within me that hinders me from your presence take it away those things that hinders me from seeking your face take it away oh, oh, Come before your presence, Jesus. That you will do what only you can do in us. Whatever doesn't look like you, let it be purged from me. Amen. Your purifying fire. Your purifying fire. Take it away. Yeah. Oh, if there be anything that hinders my worship, take it away. We are desperate for you. Oh, if there be anything that hinders me from you oh take it away take it away oh if there be anything that hinders my worship take it away yeah the spirit I am your body oh. you're the life alive in me I am your temple you are the spirit oh. there's no other life in me you are the spirit I am your body Holy 
Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Oh, I am your side, I am your side, I am your side. You are mine, you are mine, you are mine. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. from me is you find me and make me true oh God I lay down all that I know I lay down all of my skills oh feel me Till all that flows from me is you Find me and make me true, oh God yeah, Find me, oh find me Lord Find me, oh find me Lord Find me and make me true, oh God Find me, oh, find me, Lord. Find me, oh, find me, Lord. Find me and make me true, God. I lay, I lay down all that I know. I lay, I lay down all of my skills. Oh, feel me, oh, feel me, till all that flows from me is you. Find me and make me true, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I am a child of God. And therefore, I am not a slave to sin, death, fear, and faith. The power of God flows through me. The grace of God works in me. The power of God helps me daily. As I go out, I walk in victory, and I am established in Christ as an oak of righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.